Yes. Let me share an experience with you that, that I had recently, which is very close to what you're saying. I had come back from the West Coast a, a month or so ago and uh, had a, a space of about 10 days where there were no demands on my time. And I had been very tired with jet lag. and So I was just living very quietly with Ellen in, in our apartment in Oxford. My only obligations were to spend time with my son who lives over the road from us and so he would come over each day or I would go over and see him for a few hours. And then I would come back to our apartment and it was very quiet. I was finishing writing my book so it was a very quiet, contemplative, restful time. And then I got a, a, a call from an old client that we're doing a project for in the pottery. And he's an extremely demanding client, very nice man, but very demanding and not the easiest character to interact with. I had to go to London to meet with him. I knew it wasn't really necessary to go to London to have the meeting. It could easily have been done over the phone. But I felt that it was the right thing to do in this relationship. We're doing a big project for him, so I went. On the, on, on the train to his offices in Kensington. And, and I was struck. I, it shocked me because I had, it was so long, actually it was only 10 days or so, that I had really been out into the world to engage with it. And, and I had, there was just, I, I felt so open and so borderless and so total lack of resistance and then I went into the heart of London on public transport and I felt exactly what you describe that the, the bombardment on all sides be like me and in this meeting it was even more so it was this slight indignation I could feel from the other that I, that I wasn't fully involved and it even caused some irritation on the other side that I wouldn't that I couldn't come come completely and I felt the pull from the world exactly as you describe to be like me to get real to be some to be somebody to be an object and I have to confess also I felt some resistance to that I felt myself for a moment don't 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 do this don't try and get hold of me don't and then I felt this resistance and how that resistance was more of the same. It was a reflection, it was a mirror of, of the behavior that was, was happening. And, and, and then so I saw this, this resistance come up and, and, and then let it go and realized that I didn't need to protect myself from this demand from the world to be somebody, to be an object, that to protect myself from it was, was one way that the world, of letting the world win. It was playing the world's game. By refusing to play the world's game, I was playing the world's game. That actually, it was completely the opposite, to be, to be totally open. Because that is where we are safe. That is the only security, is to be this totally open presence. And I could feel this, this character, I could feel the, the activity of trying to get hold of me. Trying to, as long as I resisted, he was winning. He was, he was making me into someone, a resisting someone. But as long as I wasn't that someone, as long as there was no resistance, he was just barking in the wind. He was just, there was nothing there. And he didn't feel any resistance. So he didn't feel that he was being frustrated because there was no resistance there. And the meeting softened. And we started smiling, we started laughing. We start, and it was so sweet in the end. Everything that we needed to get done, he, got, he actually ended up apologizing. He had thought that I had done a few things, had got things wrong. And, and actually, I knew that in this case, I had been very careful 
and had done everything that he had done. And he co even called one of his guys in New York. I think this, and Rupert says this, which of us is right? And his guy in New York, I heard him, I had him on loud speak, he said, well, actually, Rupert's right. He, he did the, and this guy, this, this defensive, ag aggressive, he put the phone down, he said, I'm so sorry. You, you were right, you, all, all along, the, what you had done was, was what we originally agreed. And he was so soft, and it was so sweet at the end. So, and then I went home, I just got the train home again. And when I got home, I recalled this whole incident of, of going out into the world that seems, as you say, to, to demand that we play its game, that we become someone or something, and, and the slight resistance to that, and how that actually subtly perpetuates, and, and how the letting go of that resistance. And that's what I meant earlier at the end of our meditation, where I say we find ourselves at the heart of experience. I didn't need to go back to the flat to find that peace again, to find that independence. Right there, in the heart of this slightly awkward, intense situation, right there, without the resistance, that was where the peace and the freedom was, right in the midst of it. The important thing is not to have an agenda right. with the person not you, you may see a, a, a display of ego a, a display of a sense of separation trying to aggrandize itself or trying to protect itself or one of the numerous ways that the separate self perpetuates itself you may see that that's not a judgment it's an observation it's fine to see that right but it's another thing to have an agenda with it and to have an agenda with it is exactly the same as the ego that you are observing. In other words, it's e only the ego in, in ourself that would have an agenda with another ego. So th make the distinction very clearly between observing the sense of separation in yourself, but here we're talking about relationship with others. Make the distinction between observing the sense of separation however it displays itself in another, and judging it. Right. And it's then, a, awareness does the observing, the separate self does the judging. Yeah? That's the difference. So you take your stand as awareness, you do the observing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But that's the first thing. Not to have an agenda with this, not to feel that it's wrong, that it needs to be corrected. It's okay just as it is. This display is okay just as it is. You, awareness, don't have an agenda with it. And then the second thing is to realize that what this other really is, is this presence of awareness. And there's, there's only one presence of awareness something that is without limits. There can't be more than one of it. We know in our own experience this aware presence, it doesn't have an edge. It doesn't stop anywhere. There aren't lots of awarenesses. So this one that you are speaking to is your very own intimate self. Now, in between, like a kind of screen, there is a display of thoughts and feelings and behaviors and, and gestures that betray a belief that we are in, in the other, that betray a belief that we are something other than this presence of awareness. So, but this display that you are dealing with, it's just a set of conditioned thoughts and feelings and activities and gestures. You, so you relate to who, when you speak to them in your, in your heart, re relate to who they truly are. Don't buy their story that they are a separate self. That they don't, don't don't reject it. Don't judge it and reject it. But don't buy it. Let it do its thing. And 
you can respond to it appropriately. It doesn't mean that you just ignore what they're saying. No, you, you, you respond appropriately. But really, the one you are speaking to is, is, is the, the presence behind this. And just that is enough. Because this will, that attitude will ensure that whatever words you use that are, that, that are responding to their words are somehow impregnated with this understanding. So although the actual content of the conversation may be what you did and what I did and what, it may be relative psychological stuff, nevertheless your responses will be, will be saturated in this deeper understanding and something of that, of your response, will percolate through the conditioning to, to who they really are, and in a kind of resonance. Who they really are, it's as if they wake up. This, this gentleman that I was meeting in, in London the other day, when, when his, his guy in New York told him that actually he had made a mistake, so right there he had been, all of, for 10 minutes he'd been telling me that I had got it wrong, and then right there on the loudspeaker on the phone, his guy told him, no, no, you made a mistake. What Rupert's saying was what we agreed. And when I heard that, there was just no response in me at all. It wasn't manufactured. There just there was no feeling of, oh, there you are, I was right all along. It just didn't arise. It was just, those are the facts. And he must have felt that. He must have felt that there wasn't the least judgment of him. There was no, okay, there you are, I told you, you're wrong. So in other words, if I had felt that, I would have squashed him into a person. You are wrong. And I was, and he would have felt, even if I had felt it, he would have felt diminished. He would have, he would have been made into a person. But because I didn't feel that, not through any effort, it just didn't, arise. He felt that, so at that moment, the sense of separation in him, it just, it couldn't stand, because there was nothing to fight against. And at that moment, the conversation changed its tone. Because he, he was, just for a moment, liberated. He could, although he would never formulate it like this, I wasn't referring to an ignorant person. I wasn't in relationship with this person who, who, who was wrong in this case. And he was liber and I could see it on his face, that the whole tone, the body language, everything changed.